Okay, today we talk about the difference between competence and competency. We talk about an article that looks at peak performance. Hello and welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 29. Today is February 9th, 2019. My name is Benjamin Stewart calling from beautiful Aguascalientes. Good morning, everybody. This is Piri Herrera. We are starting one episode. Again, another episode for Teacher Learning Cast. Welcome the guys that are joining, Mitsunari, Nancy, uh, Ricardo. Thank you for passing by, Luis Gutierrez, Briones. Uh, we hope you can join us today. We are opening the Hangout session in case you want to jump in. And, uh, and join us to talk about education and learning and a little bit about language teaching and learning. Yeah, a good way to reach out to us uh, is through Facebook. We have a Facebook page, Teacher Learning Cast, where you can leave comments either during the broadcast or certainly during the recordings. We try to provide a link where you can access all of the prior recordings. We've been now doing this about a year, right, Petey? And uh, almost every week we uh, did take a, a little break over Christmas, but uh, now we're in uh, the second week of the new year here and uh, looking forward to getting into it uh, a little bit more. But we really would like to invite anyone. We know we get a lot of people come in and out throughout the uh, Facebook feed, and but we shared the link this morning to the live broadcast. So we would love to have anyone just come in and out if you want to come and say a few words. You don't have to stay for the whole broadcast. You don't have to have anything prepared. If it's something that you want to discuss and share with us, uh, this is why we do this, is to reach out to other educators, other English teachers, other language teachers, anyone who's interested in sharing their experiences re related to their own teaching practice and, of course, what's going on in their own classroom, their own uh, learners, and maybe even challenges that they're facing. Yeah, it's not a big science to talk about what you do every day. So uh, it's exactly what we're doing here. And you can join us and do the same. Talk about whatever you do every day in your classes, whether you teach or take classes. It's OK for us just to go through all your ideas and thoughts about education a little bit. Uh, ben, we've been uh, discussing different topics, uh, taking back the regular season to, to come back every Saturday morning at 8.15, and, um, and today, uh, after last week, we discussed about uh, what, we were, what we were doing in our classrooms for the semester, and a couple of things came up. And, uh, and today, Ben, you want to talk about competence and competency, so uh, why don't we jump in? Yeah, well, it's kind of an extension of a prior broadcast we had where we talked about flow. You brought up a really good uh, presentation and discussion about flow and how to reach flow, and we had some opinions back and forth about that. It was an interesting conversation. So if you're uh, interested in that, you might want to look up that prior uh, broadcast. But I'd like to kind of extend this, and uh, I think last week you shared another good um, article about uh, competence. And I wanted to kind of set up the article by first talking about the differences between the word competence and competency. And uh, let me know if you can see my screen. I should be sharing. Yeah, we are, we are. Okay. So, um, so before we get into the article, this is the article we're going to talk about today, the great paradox of peak performance. But before we get into that, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the notion of competence and competency, because I know we talk a lot about competency-based education or competency-based learning and what that really means. And there's, you know, I, I was going through um, looking at different articles and it's actually hard to distinguish. There's a lot of not, there's, there's not a lot of um, agreement really between the di distinction between these two terms. So it's, I find it kind of interesting. Um, here it says, uh, I, I found this article, this is Wikipedia, of course, competency-based learning, and there's a lot of information about it. Um, but the one thing that stands out to me, 
And one thing that I want to keep thinking about today in, in, in our discussion is when it says here, what it means to, to have mastered a competency depends on the learning domain. And we're going to come back to that here, but I want to bring this up at the beginning because I, I do want to relate this and tie it into English language or language learning generally, but specifically English language learning, uh, because a lot of what we're going to talk about today also relates to the business world, uh, working for companies. They use this, these terminologies quite a bit as well. But we're, we're definitely going to have, we'll have to try to tie this back into English language learning because I think there's some unique aspects to, uh, to the, these terminologies as it, as it uh, applies to our own uh, context. But I, I want to share with you, and I, I bring this up um, because, and I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I, I want to reach out to some of my learners who are in the process now of looking up information from online sources. They're, they're looking at primary research articles from peer-reviewed journals, academic articles that sometimes we assume is, uh, I guess that we assume because it went through a peer review process that the information is uh, is is reliable that it's uh, that it's clear and and I just want to sh share with you this highlighted information and I'm not even going to read it I'm just going to go on to the next uh, point but I I want if you're watching this video to pause this and read this and and look for yourself how even a published article can actually make no sense whatsoever. So I'm not going to go into this because this is not really the purpose here, but I, I've just happened to come across this, trying to myself find others who have said, you know, what the differences are between these two terminologies. And I came across this article and found it interesting. And I found it, uh, you know, pretty um, revealing when we still need to be critical when we find information online uh, especially from peer-reviewed journals, that we can't just take it for face value, that we have to critique it and say, well, does this make sense or not, and still make a value judgment. Right. But let me, let me go into the first <laughs> um, text that actually makes some sense. And here they uh, define competency-based learning as uh, systems of instruction, assessment, grading, and academic reporting. So they are talking in terms of education here, but it, very broad-based uh, looking at uh, different aspects of the educational process. Uh, reporting on the base, uh, on, are based on students demonstrating that they have learned the knowledge and skills that are expected to learn as they progress through education. Okay. Now, um, they go on to say that in public schools, competency-based systems use state uh, the learning standards. And this is something we haven't talked a lot about but a lot of times uh, competency-based learning is kind of geared or linked to uh, standards. Uh, and I, I think that's a, an important uh, distinction. Here at the bottom, it says defining competency-based learning is uh, complicated by the fact that educators not only use a wide variety of terms for the general approach, but the terms may or may not be used synonymously from place to place. Okay. Right, so they may have different terms meaning different things, or maybe they use the same terms. A few of uh, the more common synonyms include proficiency based, mastery based, outcome based, performance based, standards based education. So, I think it's important to note that we're going to talk about this article that's called competence, competence based, or just competence, but here they're talking about competency, competency based education, okay. and Again, it's it's sometimes kind of hard to distinguish between those two. I want to share another uh, interesting difference here where they talk about uh, competence refers to the person's ability or skills and knowledge that he or she uh, possesses. And competencies refers to uh, of a job referred to the, the, to the description of how things have to be done and at what level. All right, so you see that they're kind of back and forth. You know, there's not a real clear difference here that even some others who have been publishing and been thinking about these two terms, that there is not a clear consensus really on these differences. Okay. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, 
I, I'm not that into. Uh, I haven't looked at it like uh, this way, like going through different articles and looking at different points of view. But I can have the sense that one, it's based. I mean, uh, from what I uh, read before somewhere, and I don't even remember because long ago that I haven't seen this uh, use of terms, but competency. Uh, the idea that the competence is mostly focused on what the learner can do and competency would be uh, to be able to do it according to the preset standards. Is that, is that, am I right at that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to, you know, for me personally, I tend to look at competence more broadly. Okay. And um, I, there's one article here that showed it actually had a chart but competence being more broadly, competency being a slightly more specific in how things are done. Let me see if I can find this. Yeah, it's this one here. I like this breakdown where they break, they divide up competence. Okay. They basically say here that competence describes what, what people can do while competency focuses on how they do it. So they break it down competence as skill-based, standard obtained what is measured so it's the outcome it's the it's the thing that they can do whereas competency is more behavioral based so you have the manner in which the the behavior is taking place and how the 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 standard is achieved now i'm not necessarily saying that this is you know the way to look at it but i think it's an, it is an interesting way that that i think uh distinguishes clear clearly between these two ideas and you know i think one of the things that i've always been concerned about when someone uses the term competency-based education or competency competency-based learning is mm -hmm. well what competency are we talking about i mean we can list all these competencies but i start i feel like we're going back to this behavioral objective mm -hmm. uh idea where sometimes that can be a limitation because as you know, right, how many behaviors, right, can we list? If we're trying to plan a class and we list two or three behaviors, there are gonna be so many additional behaviors that we can look at that we ought to consider as well, that it also, it becomes difficult to really think in terms of behavioral objectives, okay. right? Uh, where we have, you know, these expressive objectives, which might be a better way to, to look at it. We can kind of talk about that in another, another uh, broadcast. But I think this idea of competency versus competence, okay. um, I think is something to at least consider, or have clear in your mind as, as a teacher to see what it means within the context of your own teaching practice. Yeah, and now that you bring it up, uh, I kind of uh, recall the way I handle with my students, my, my teachers in training, uh, the idea of setting the objective, stating the objective, and I mostly go for the idea of stating a behavior and a degree in the objective, which at the end, uh, now that you're mentioning all this, uh, maybe I'm not really taking it just like a, a plain behavior, maybe I'm just kind of considering also this idea of the competency of students since we are going through the different dimensions of language like uh the form the function the context the actual uh the real life application i make a lot of emphasis on that and at the end it's not just a plain behavior it's more, more much more complex than that maybe what i'm asking them to do and yeah when when we focus on the idea of what's going to happen in the classroom we look for a basic let's say a basic performance or, or a pattern maybe to follow, uh, put it in plain words, we are looking for vocabulary and structure together functioning into communication. But that implies a huge number of things, including other vocabulary, other connotations, the context, students' previous knowledge, uh, and a lot of things that they gotta put together. Uh, and I'm going through this with the idea of um, Maybe that's the way competency works, right? The, the idea of uh, being multi-task, to call it one way, maybe not, it's not the best word, multi-task, but multi, um, uh, at the same time, you gather many things and you put them into action to achieve one, uh, to achieve certain um, speech acts 
from which you expect to get something. I'm like, yeah. Going through, I mean, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, I'm looking at my, I'm thinking about my class that I'm teaching this semester thesis seminar, and I'm thinking, all right, if I, how do I articulate a behavioral objective okay. when they have to go through a process of writing a, a literature review, instrument design, data collection, results and discussion, they have to present, so there's a public speaking aspect to it, they have to reflect because they're reflecting every week, and and so how am I going to list these behavioral objectives, let alone the degree to which they're to meet those behavioral objectives, right? So, yeah, when I'm thinking about terms like competence and competency, I'm leaning more towards the idea of competence. Are they competent thinkers, writers, and even, are you know, they can, uh, communicators, right, of their ideas, their arguments, can they form arguments? And this is where I go back to, you know, thinking of terms, any type of class that you teach, right? Any class that I teach, I'm thinking, you know, being can my students apply an argument? Because that applies to almost every class that, at least that I teach. Can they form an argument? Can they communicate their ideas? Can they uh, reach a consensus, right? So if they're going to work together, things like that. So we're looking more at kind of these, ex what I would call expressive type of, um, you know, of, of uh, goals or outcomes versus these very, very specific behavioral objectives or what some people refer to as competencies, competency, right? So it's just right. to get really specific. And, you know, this, I don't know if you can see this yeah. image. It's a little bit small on my screen, but. Yeah, it's going to be red. For, just maybe for the ones in Facebook, they cannot do it, but. Guys, uh, just parentheses, you can click on the link above and you can go to a better view first place. Okay, go ahead, man. Right, but just to, just to again, I, and I don't want to try to confuse the history here, but it is confusing when I, when I read <laughs> other, all these different uh, aspects. But here you see a circle of competencies, and inside the competencies you have skills, knowledge, and attitudes. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're not talking about competencies as a specific skill, right? But some would argue that competency is a, something very specific where competence is more broad. So right there, this is just like I'm going back and forth. And if it's hard to follow, it is hard to follow because, because people, uh, the experts here, can't seem to agree on what it is. It says here competency equals competence plus commitment. Okay. Right? So this is kind of the opposite now. So competence... You have ability, I guess, to to do something, competence and a characteristic, where you have a commitment, a characteristic, you have some sort of, I guess, the will of doing something. Um, but I, I just want to throw these out there and uh, and encourage those who are really thinking about using these terms to have have it clear in your mind the differences here between these these two terms. And when we talk about today's article, The Great Paradox of Peak Performance, you know, they are primarily focusing on the term com uh, competence, basically. Yes. So, and this is the reason why I'm trying to right. have us think about, well, what, what, it what does it really mean, right, uh, in terms of the differences between competence and competency. But um, I don't know, why don't we jump into this article, PD, and uh, maybe you can introduce uh, some of these terms, some of the things that you found were interesting, and we can, uh, we can discuss those. Right. Uh, what, what happens when I find an article, sometimes it's something totally uh, from another field, and maybe it's not about education sometimes. This indeed is it's an author that mostly focuses on physical and mental performance. And I saw like the article is kind of focused a little bit more on the, an example based on physical performance, like uh, I suppose athletes or, or sport people that really uh, develop certain uh, certain competence, as he called uh, as he calls it. And uh, but the idea in here is to bring whatever we can apply into our classroom. Sometimes we are talking about even a different thing. And, and, it, and it may sound uh, weird to bring up things, for example, if we talk about the field of uh, architecture or, or, or construction, but uh, there are some terms which sometimes are interesting. And in this case, 
uh, these guys is not that far away from education, thinking about that he's talking about the development of physical and mental abilities. I kind of read a little bit about him just to try to have a glance uh, of what uh, he does. And, and he goes on the idea of uh, success, happiness, and performance, getting the most of yourself, uh, kind of a coach thing. And, and indeed, he calls his, himself a coach. And his name is Brad Stolberg. And then the, I just found this article. Uh, I don't know if I don't really remember if I ran into it by looking at some other information on, or is this one of these things that just pop up when you go through the web or Facebook? I don't really remember that, but uh, I read it because precisely that day, I remember I was talking to my students about the idea that teachers work is before the class. Uh, that's the way I put it with my students. I'm thinking it twice later. I thought teachers work is before and after the class. And during the class, though we have a lot of in progress decision to make, as I put it in, in, in words for them, uh, the class is showtime, is a fun time, is when you come and you are ready with everything you prepare uh, according to students and objectives and other aspects. Uh, we can go widely and, and, and talk about planning, but, but the thing is that the hard work is the preparation of what you are going to do in the classroom. And mostly what you're going to do is it would be what the students are going to do in the classroom. So once you come to the classroom, uh, I call it showtime because it's the moment in which you just put into practice everything you prepare and the hard work you, ma you make. And, uh, and ideally, exactly that's what I told them, you have to enjoy the class. You have a nice experience. We just read also another article from, um, it's a very famous article among teachers here in Mexico that uh, it's uh, called La Aventura de Ser Profesor from uh, Jose M. Steve. And he talks about different things about new teachers uh, uh, that uh, are facing the real world of students for the first time. And he also agrees with some ideas. And uh, But one of the points he makes is that uh, as an important aspect of the class is that me, as a teacher, I have to have fun. Uh, but not in the sense that we're going to play games and we're going to have fun. <laughs> I have to enjoy what I'm doing at that moment. But that's the last part. That's the ending of a series of ideas that, that he brings. In fact, it's in the middle of, the, of, of his article. But he brings a lot of ideas, and he makes you think about different aspects for the class. And then he adds this at the end. You have to, fun, to have fun. And I take it like the idea of, um, of precisely having the work before thinking about your students, planning, preparing your material, looking for the form, the function, the context, uh, how you're gonna put it, what you're gonna do, thinking about the process in class. I, I, I always ask my, ask my students to think about processes in the classroom and uh, stating processes, going through the process, practicing at home certain things. One of the rules that I, that I ask them to, to respect is everything you're gonna ask your students to do do it yourself before the class so you have a, an experience a close experience about what you're asking your students to do so after that you come to the classroom and then you have fun certain way now don't, don't get me wrong i know there's a lot to do it's also part of the job there's a lot of in progress decision and quick thinking you have to do in the classroom but it all gets easier and easier uh with the experience of preparing yourself and preparing yourself again and planning again the same class and next semester or next term or with the other group replanning what you just planned even though it's the same level and they are the same topic the same book just going through it again it's going to help you a little bit better so this is pretty much some like um the sport words the what they i if i'm not wrong about that they call it um muscle memory or something like that in which they do it once and over and over and over again until the body itself starts to make it automatically. And there's a moment in which uh, you don't even think about it. The body itself 
performs the action and 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 if you're lucky you get to pick kind of perfection to put it certain in certain words and and i and i kind of make an analogy of this with the when when, when i got to this article uh, with the idea that oh uh, if you plan your classes if you prepare yourself if you go over and over through it again it gets easier it gets easier every time the uh, easier in the way that your decision uh, your your moment for making decision which at the end is going to be uh the maybe a moment in which you have a lot of decisions to make is during the class itself the in progress decisions get easier and your thinking gets faster and sometimes you just react uh because you already internalize or or develop certain skills automatically and then you just you just react about that uh, so, so far, this is pretty much the idea, the general view of what this article talks about. So, Ben, any comments so far? Yeah, and I'm, I'm really, I'm looking at, and I don't know if you can see my screen, but I'm looking at this uh, visual, this image here, where they talk about the unconscious incompetence moving to the conscious incompetence, to the conscious competence, right. and the unconscious competence. And you know, I, you know, I don't totally disagree with this, but I'm, I, I just, I have a lot of questions. It actually generates more questions to me than than really answers. When, I, and I'm trying to think of your context. I'm trying to think of a teacher or trainer who is moving from first and second semester as uh, as a novice, gaining more experience in later semesters. How this this stage, this process of moving from unconscious incompetence works, you know, for them. When you talk about, you know, the importance of planning and then being able to enjoy the actual classroom experience because you have planned well and and being able to then reflect, I guess, on on that experience. Um, because there's there's certain things here that that stand out to me when I read read through this article. Um, and if, just starting with the first one, unconscious incompetence, you know, and they're talking about it as uh, it, most of us experience, we most, most of us, uh, most of us experience this when we are uh, brand new at something. We don't know what we're doing and we don't know that we don't know what we're doing. So I'm trying to put myself into the teacher trainer's shoes here in the first semester. And and then progressing through as they gain experience. I mean, is is it true that we always, at some point, don't know what we don't know? I mean, how does that differ from from not knowing from the very beginning? As and again, thinking of terms of going through a BA, right? Your first semester students from your eighth semester students. Okay. Um, I don't know. What are your What are your thoughts on on that? Either this the earlier stages, both the the unconscious incompetence versus the conscious incompetence. Yeah, the this other author, Jose and Steve, in the other article, I was kind of uh, going through also. He also mentions one thing that we have to recognize uh, as um, not as a fact, but as a possible idea that the initial point. It's going to be ignorance. The initial point at uh, for learners. That's the way he puts it. Well, in other words, right? I'm just paraphrasing. Uh, but you have to recon that that's a, a huge possibility, and you have to be prepared to uh, I don't know to scaffold uh, according to students. So, uh, in teacher training, I kind of disagree with the idea that uh, we don't know. There are a couple of things uh, there, like, for example, like saying that you are doing things wrong or that you don't know at all. In Specifically, in the example of teachers uh, at a BA, we have students at a BA level which have been in classrooms for long, for 19 years. So they have an idea, maybe from a different perspective, uh, but they have an idea of what classes are. Now, whatever that means, uh, a positive or a reinforcing idea of something that it's um, effective, or maybe they have an idea 
of that it has to be that way, but it's not something that effective in the classroom, or at least in most settings, and not to say that it's wrong. So uh, sometimes it's not that they don't know uh, what, uh, it's like the, the phrase says, we don't know what we are doing, and we don't know that we don't know what we are doing. <laughs> um, yeah. I see this as the idea of uh, details and the specifics about it, because they do know they're teaching a class. They do know they have to be, uh, maybe they don't know the technical terms or they don't know the uh, systematic way to put it, but they know there has to be input in the classroom, even though they don't know what uh, the term input. Uh, they know there has to be students work, even though they don't know what kind of work there has to be, because they have certain experience about that. Beyond that, uh, I don't know, I think uh, this unconscious incompetence, uh, it's not 100% unconscious, but yes, I also agree there may be things we, we don't really detect that uh, we don't decipher that we have a we, we have a, an issue with it example beginners and some students at high levels they tend to specify in their lesson plans uh the teacher will give the instructions for the activity and they exactly know what the activity is but they haven't really structured the way they are going to give the instructions and that's what i call fake planning not because they are not planning or they, or they are faking it. They think they plan, but they haven't. They haven't thought about which words they're going to use or which strategy for giving instructions they're going to use. And many times they don't even know that our strategy is for giving instruction. So that may be part of this unconscious incompetence in that sense. Uh, another example is uh, when I ask my students, what strategy for color repetition you are going to use. And they don't go outside just asking students to repeat as a choir. And they don't have any other idea that there are different ways, different uh, dynamics to carry this repetition in the classroom with different um, aids or different commands or different uh, gestures, instruction and they are not really aware that there's a variety of it. I think this is part of the, uh, they don't know uh, exactly that they don't know. They, they don't know what they, what they don't know exactly. And this is where reflection comes. I start asking things and I start um, trying to pull from them to vary the thinking, not just to go through a plain line, but start to see what can change in the dynamic of the classroom. I don't know if that pretty much answers the, the question, man. Yeah, my, my feeling is, and I'm going to try to provide kind of analogy to this, but m before I do that, it seems like that at all levels of experience, there's always something that we don't know that we don't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, and so what I don't like about this article really, or what I think it ignores is the importance of context. Okay. The, what I mean by that is, the it it's too much of an individualistic process in mm -hmm. in my view why because let's take a learner a teacher trainer in first semester in the ba right we have certain courses that are designed right to to gradually help facilitate the, this teacher the student teacher into more uh complex behaviors uh, teaching practices right so we don't throw them out in front of a class the first semester right so in that first semester the context is of course simpler and so they're going to know and they're not they're going to know what they know they're they're going to know what they don't know and and all of those things but within the context of in this case a class or, or an experience that's simpler less complex right because they're 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 not ready to perhaps be teachers so in that case the the this stage that this article talks about is much different than let's take the eighth semester student now now who has a lot more experience 
but now they're in a much complex, more complex situation. Yeah, of course. Right. Right. They're they're going to still they're going to probably have more things that they don't know that they don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? This this is the opposite of what this article proposes. Yeah. This article says in the early stages of your personal development, mm -hmm. you're there's a lot that you don't know that you don't know. But as you gain experience, there's le it's less, right? But I, I look at it almost the opposite. The more experience, the more things you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. Of course. Yeah. Right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. And so in so when it, it all and what does that depend on? It depends on context. So okay. I look at it, I'm gonna give you an analogy, a music analogy. I know I you have a lot of background in music. I have a little bit myself, and this makes for me. It, it, it's very much similar to the musician, the beginning musician who just starts out. Mm -hmm. You don't throw that person in with necessarily with professionals who, where they're, they're not going to be able to keep up, mm -hmm. right? If I'm a beginner playing bass, they're not going to throw me into a very professional group because I'm not going to be able to keep up and it's, and it's going to destroy the whole group. Mm -hmm. All right. So my context is I'm going to play with, maybe musicians that uh, uh, that are a little bit, or at least around my same level or maybe a little bit better, okay? So I can get better. That makes sense. But it's gonna, it's still going to be more or less my same level. Okay. So I'm going to be able to know what I know. I'm going to be able, I'm going to be, quote, unquote, successful or in the musical experience mm -hmm. because of my, everybody else that I interact with, right? But... Mm -hmm. Of course, my the other fellow musicians who are a little bit better than me, if they're a little bit better than me, then I can improve and so on, right? So if I play, if I'm the best musician and everybody, everybody else in my group is horrible, then that's also going to affect me as well. And mm -hmm. so if we take this as from a teaching and educational standpoint, a teacher is going to be quote-unquote good a lot of times based on the students that they have, like how they adapt to the, the, the students that they have. Mm -hmm. And so they need, you know, if in, in our case, in the BA, we actually have courses that are designed to provide some experience uh, before they get into the real classroom experience so that students can gain the, the, the skills and knowledge that they need. But, you know, even when teachers get to have some sort of professional experience and they're out teaching out in different schools, when they go to another school, mm -hmm. right, it could be an adjustment for them and they learn, you know, how to maybe deal with a new system, a new uh, way of teaching based on the school, if that's the case. But my point here is, it, I think it, it deals, this has more to do with uh, context than necessarily yeah. just going through this process of unconscious incompetence to unconscious competence without any regard of of context right and uh you know that the 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 actual dynamic between the individual and his or her surroundings yeah i i totally agree with that and with that idea and um i think this often in this case is more focusing on physical performance because even he starts talking about the sports and all that and even though yeah i i even though it's physical oh uh, i i'm looking at this idea at something that it's not linear it's not like just going right. from conscious incompetence to unconscious competence i i say it like uh because indeed he talks about the flow also he he brings up the doctors uh, chicks and Haley ideas if you remember we talked about the flow uh, I'm going to share my screen here again. Well, for the first time, me, right? You are, you're sharing yours, right? And uh, just to remind a little bit the, the idea of flow, can you see my screen now? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty much the graph, uh, a different version of the graph about the flow idea. And the flow, it's just to remind, you can go back to, to that episode. Uh, you can look into the playlist and 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 there's one in which we discuss about this for for the whole um for the whole program for for the whole episode but very quickly 
The idea of flow is to get into a channel in which you are comfortable and successful at what you are doing, which would be uh, this line in the middle, the white line. Uh, and out of the flow, you fall into anxiety or boredom. Why? Because there are there's a task or there are activities or there's a performance that is expected from you. And there are certain skills you have. Now, the idea of flow is that uh, when the task is higher, and it, it's not in the bad, not higher, but it, there's no balance between the challenge you have and the skills. I would add the attitudes and, um, and also the knowledge uh, that you have are not in balance. And, it's, and the challenge is a little bit above your capacities at that moment, you fall into anxiety. But the idea in here is that you are aware about that and then you start working on the development of the skills and knowledge and the attitudes that are required to reach that challenge. That's the moment in which I think this idea would come. You realize there's something wrong, I'm getting anxious, and uh, you, you start being aware of whatever you need. In this case, if you go through the anxiety side, it would be a major development in order to achieve and, and be successful at the challenge. And, uh, and you work it out. So, Petey, looking at this chart, how much of this flow, that when you achieve flow, how much of it is coming from the individual, him or herself or herself, versus the influences on the surroundings or those individuals that are interacting with that particular person. Take, for example, again, music. I don't know if you've had this experience where you've just lost yourself in, in the music. Like you're, you're the whole feeling of time and space kind of put, get put aside and you're just in the moment. Right. right. So, and, but it doesn't always happen. You could play the same song, right. A lot, many times, but it, and it doesn't always happen. It just, sometimes it just kind of, appears out of nowhere i mean this has been my experience mm -hmm. so how much of that is the individual musician versus the influences and interactions that are taking place at that moment with other fellow musicians same way with teachers when you reach this flow where you're in a class things are just moving along right it's not always just the the individual teacher who is experiencing this feeling of flow yeah. Mm -hmm. It's actually the interactions that are taking place at that moment from the students in this case, right, that are that are interacting, right? So I think that when we look at that and think about that type of, uh, you know, flow, it's not just reaching some level of competence and then saying, okay, now I'm going to be in flow because I have some level of competence. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. I, and I, I could see – I'm I, sorry. I could see a – teaching a teacher trainer in first semester reach flow just as often as an eighth semester uh, teacher trainer uh, reach flow, but for two totally different reasons or different experiences. You know what I mean? For me, well, to begin with the idea of flow, again, it's, it's same that the other, the, 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 in, in the other idea of, uh, of uh, the peaky performance. Uh, the ideal thing is to understand that uh, it's not a linear thing. You have to be going back and forth towards both sides. Because on the other side, we have boredom because the idea is that you have made your skills and the challenge, and there's a moment in which uh, you get bored. <laughs> or whatever you can name, uh, or you want to name that part when the skills are above the challenge. I think the flow itself is going back and forth. That I would say, not just uh, I get into the flow and I go in here and I'm that's it. Now, I think going through the flow is exactly, and I, I don't know because I just found this image on, on the internet, but I don't know if that what it means by this line in the middle, that you actually go back and forth. Now, is it an individual thing? In the case of the other article of the uh, picking performance, I think they're talking about more of about physical achievement, uh, like high performance uh, sport, uh, sport people. Anyhow, yes, I think uh, I think I would need to read the whole book to see if they are covering this aspect. But yes, I agree with you that learning is not an individual thing. It's uh, it's a thing which whether you are with another person or not, there are um, 
there are things around you or there are prior experiences or there are prescriptive things that help you alone. Uh, it's like going back to the analogy of the musical instrument. You don't sit down and just play by yourself. Maybe you can do it, but pretty much the idea is that you already understand what the instrument is. So there's somebody else's before that designed the instrument and had a, a logical uh, organization of what the instrument is if we go from zero, right? Uh, so unless you create your own weird instrument, uh, that, that would be maybe by your own. And I would still argue, uh, how did you get the notion of music maybe or playing an instrument? Well, but yes, there's always something around. And we can talk about many, many, many aspects that surround us, like the moment, the feeling, the environment, the weather, uh, the, in this case, about uh, language learning, the teacher that is in front of you, uh, the setting in the classroom, the working with classmates. And in that sense, I would go totally for, Ken's, uh, uh, for Ken Robinson's idea that uh, Learning it totally, it's not individual. It's it's something that we have to uh, talk about, we have to discuss, we have to put it in words and, and, and share with others so we can actually start realizing more, a little bit more about this unconscious incompetence, which after all I said, it may be uh, clear that my idea is that this unconscious incompetence, as you said, happens every time because the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. <laughs> yeah, and, and the other extreme is the unconscious <clears throat> competence. Mm -hmm. There, You're likely to have that equally mm -hmm. as much as a lower level, you know, uh, professional as you will yes. a higher level professional or, or, you know, because this is why I think it's it's more complex and I think it depends more on the interaction between the individual and his or her surroundings with other individuals and in this case. Um, and really, I, you know, I'm thinking back in my days when I was studying music, you know, when I, I remember first semester going into the university as a uh, undergraduate musician major, music major, not knowing very much at all, but but reaching flow and and having clear, I would consider uh, unconscious competence in, right. at that particular level and enjoying it basically, enjoying this flow and having fun even at the very low, low level. And then as you gain as I gained experience, those experiences changed, but I still had all of these conscious, unconscious competencies. Right. You know, it all was there. You know, it's all in there. And it and it's not all that different. It's just the context is different. And, you know, you could say my competence might have been improved. Right. Right. Or, you know, my skill or whatever, my knowledge. But but as far as the conscious and unconscious part of it, I, I don't see much of a difference. And there's one other aspect that we haven't really talked about, and that's the word subconscious, which if we talk about, you know, Chomsky's mm -hmm. con uh, you know, competence and performance, distinction, we, we, that's a whole nother thing, this subconscious right. knowledge or, or uh, understandings where it's, yeah. it's automatic, which I actually think is more appropriate uh, of yeah. a term Let me than give you this idea. unconscious conscious distinction let me give you my idea about the unconscious competence uh and, and that's where i uh, get the the sense that this is multi focus on f totally physical activities thinking about that somebody's training for something and he rich picks uh, he picks in 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 the performance and uh maybe there's i don't know if there's a limit for the body but maybe there is i would say I go for the idea that there is a limit. Uh, but uh, let me put it in my experience. I have one student last semester, teachers uh, that are that were for the first time, the simulated classes that we've discussed many times in here. And he gives instructions in an oral way, only 
and our own way, which I normally tend to tell them, bring the instructions written or bring material for giving instructions and look for a way, look for a proper process for the instructions in which you involve the students and you make it easier and decide what you are going to command and what you have to explain along the instruction, the instructions and, uh, and, and different, different views. This teacher, uh, new teacher, gives instructions in a normal way. He is the one that is speaking. Complex, complex processes, a lot of things to do from students. And he manages to make them understand at the first time he speaks, which is totally against from what I've seen regularly. When there's, complex, when there's a set of instructions, which are many steps, and they are given orally, even though they are simple, students forget the first ones because it's many instructions. So I, I recommend them not to give all of the instructions all at, all at once or just in an oral way. Now, this teacher manages to do that, and it's always clear. And the first time I saw it, I didn't know why. And I told, that in feedback, I told him in feedback, you are doing exactly what I ask everybody not to do. But you manage to pull it through, and the students understand what the activity is, and they don't forget what the steps are. And they go through and they manage to do it. And I see that as unconscious competence because he has a certain level of achievement. It's something effective in the classroom, but he's a beginner. It's the first time. So I'm not looking at unconscious competence as the, at, uh, as the end of the line, right? You start in unconscious incompetence and then you finish in unconscious competence. I don't look at it in that way because with this, with this example, I can tell that uh, my point of view of this teacher is that he's got unconscious competence. Now, the job in there is the other way around. And hopefully, I won't get into unconscious incompetence at the end, right? But the idea is that he gets aware and conscious of why he is succeeding specifically at giving oral instructions, many instructions, many steps for a task at a time, and he succeeds. And so I yeah, know. maybe this goes back to our distinction between and maybe confusion, and, yeah. uh, and I'll be the first to admit uh, being confused, but the difference between competence and competency. Yeah. Because, you know, again, I, I tend to think competence as being more general and versus competency as being more specific. So for me, being able to give instructions, um, is that a competence or is that a competency? Uh. And so, it, whatever word you Maybe use, from the point of view you, you view it, because if you see it as a single aspect, as part of a whole class, it goes through one connotation. But if you see it as given instructions requires a lot of elements inside and a lot of things to be conscious and aware and a lot of uh, abilities to handle in order just to give the instructions, then it goes through the other side, right? Is, is yeah. that? Yeah, it's going to depend on how you define it. I think that's why it is confusing because at the end you can view it from both sides. Now, looking at it from the point of view of uh, the different elements and aspects that have to be uh, considered. Now, it may be too much for, for example, for beginners to go through the analysis of uh, what you're going to say, which words you're going to say, how you're going to say them, which intonation is you go are you going to use for this? Are you going to involve the students? How are you going to involve the students? Are you going to ask them? Are you going to show them something? Are you going to command them? Are you going to wait for them to perform? Are you going to give two or three steps at a time and then wait for them to perform or just one at a time? I mean, you see how, right. how this can get? But at the end, the idea in here is that uh, this is the job of, of, uh, of us, our tutors. I asked him right. to watch the video, I watched the video again, and we started to try to decipher what's going on. What's going on? Right, and, and this is, I think, my point that in this particular student, maybe he has uh, a competence, he has a skill, right, that maybe right. exceeds others in this one area of giving instructions. Mm -hmm. So I guess my point is it moves the bar up. In yep. this case, now, 
this student, you can have much different as a tutor of the, for the student, you can have different conversations now with this person. You can say, okay, you, this worked very well. Now, what could you have done differently? Or even still, what could you have done better? You know, so you can have different kinds of conversations right. by moving this bar, moving this idea of conscious, unconscious competence, just move the bar up because there's still other things that need to be learned as we all can learn new things. So it's just the, I think this is my point is that, you know, we can, wherever we are in the learning process, mm -hmm. we, I think for me, the bottom line is to try to enjoy the process, first of all, as much as possible. Right. So it's, it's not like there's going to be, it's not, and I don't think it's necessarily easier or harder uh from the first semester to the eighth semester i'm thinking of my experience as a musician it wasn't easier or harder uh being as a first semester music student mm -hmm. it was it was always it was always hard and there were certain things that i found easy but yes. those things changed as i gained more proficiency right I, it, it was different but i still had things i did well and things that i did i couldn't do and that never changed and and so that's kind of the idea I, that I'm having here is with teachers and reaching flow is the importance of context, the effects that that has on the experience, but also that as we change, we can experience flow pretty much the same. It's just going to be different. It's going to look different based on our current you know levels of proficiency yeah. or a knowledge base or even our attitudes, our dispositions. But um, I think that's that's kind of the point that I, I wanted to make. Yeah, and, and what I like about this uh, article and the idea it manages is getting to the idea that once you reach a certain master degree of certain aspects, you enjoy. And, and I would put that along of, with all this discussion about uh, it's not linear, it's not that you got there, uh, but that there are moments in which you can enjoy. And I would also uh, uh, compare that to the flow in which uh, I'm prepared, I know what I'm doing, I have different alternatives, and I develop my skill to reflect and decide and take action because I've been doing it different, uh, I've been doing it over and over and over again. So when I'm in the classroom, I can do it in seconds or sometimes in less than seconds. And that's kind of, uh, it's, it's not a hard task. Let me give you a, a musical example that just happened to me. Uh, you know, I work also in, in music, singing and playing the guitar a little bit. Not an expert and not trained in, in a musical school, but uh, I do so. Uh, I perform every weekend. I have experience in scenarios for long. Uh, I, the, Bigger audience I've had is like 3,000 people maybe, long ago. But uh, recently, at the end of a course here at the university, we closed the course with a meal. And I took my guitar with me. Teachers, audience, people I know, people I've been with in different, uh, in different courses. I've ne they, they didn't know I played the guitar. They knew I sang, but I didn't know I played the guitar. And I brought my guitar. We had a fun time. But since the very first song, my fingers got really, really black. I couldn't play. And then I tried to relax myself and I tried to do it and I managed to go through a couple of songs. But there was a moment in which in the last song, I couldn't even play the tune. There was something in that setting. And I don't know what that exactly blocked every single thing that I've developed so far, whether good or bad, you can say I'm the best musician in the world or the worst, but whatever my performance is, I couldn't get it at that moment. I don't know if that makes the point that, uh, yeah, we have to be careful with, with the idea of having this as a path to follow and to reach and that I made it. <laughs> it's not linear as the flow, I think is not that is not a linear thing. I mean, the diagram helps a lot and the ideas uh, make you clear some of variations. But yes, I think uh, we go into that cycle of uh, knowing, going for it, 
understanding what we are doing uh, than uh, doing it and doing it in a way that we can be good at it. And then suddenly, uh, teachers are changed from school to different settings, different students, different moments, and your life is also in a different moment. And everything you knew that you knew, it's worthless, <laughs> it's useless in the new situation, right? Yeah, I mean, your example, I think, is a good example where maybe the the context yes. had more of an influence over your, you know, your, your efficiency. <laughs> Moment. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it was, yeah, the new situation, different, different audience. It could have been a different location. It also just could have been your, uh, you know, personal, you know, background at that moment, you know, whatever led up to that moment, you know, could have also influenced one way or the other. Uh, but, but I think you, you brought up the term again, enjoyment, like, enjoying the experience like and for me i don't feel that and maybe we disagree here slightly on this that the more experience that we have the more likely we're going to enjoy something for me i don't see it that way i see that that we enjoy it we we can enjoy it the same regardless of the level depending on the context that we're brought in at that moment right yeah, of course yeah, yeah yeah and i think that's the, that's the the point is that we realize that this idea of flow or enjoyment or this element that we find ourselves in has to deal with not only our own specific knowledge base or competency or whatever you want to call it but also the 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 context and that that you know we can't always control the context but sometimes we can and we do what we can and to you know, to interact with that context, but it really has a lot to do with the context that we find ourselves in, and that context context can change all the time. So I think that this idea of flow does kind of go back and forth. I think the chart that you had was representative of this idea with those squiggly lines, but that I think that there's some, it's, it's a complex situation. Right. So it's based on complex theory where you know, and sync and chaos theory, where there's there's so many different variables and factors that fall into it that it's not just a linear, like you said, a linear process of of going through, you know, and and then finding enjoyment, you know, more enjoyment later on. You know, I and it's not to say that you're not going to have enjoyment later yeah. on, but I think my point is you have equal enjoyment in the earlier stages right so for me it's just an, an encouragement of to enjoy the process really and regardless of where you are in the process of teaching and learning and uh proficiency is just enjoy the process as you work hard and try to learn more and put yourself in different situations where you can learn more um and and go through that process uh, that way for me i think that's the takeaway from, from and, this discussion. And, and I agree with you that you enjoy the process. I've seen you working and planning your classes and I see how passionate you get, you get about uh, looking for new ways to put the situation for the students before even getting into the class. Yeah, I totally agree with the idea that you enjoy the process. Uh, my, my idea of stressing uh, the enjoyment when you, when you get certain master degree, it's mostly with the idea uh, that I put my students at uh, with, um, uh, prepare your class, plan your class, have your material, and I in, understand there may be people that at that stage they are actually picturing what's gonna what they desire that it's gonna happen in the classroom. They're actually enjoying it, but I'm seeing it also from the point of view that when you get to the classroom and what you plan, whether changes or not, becomes something successful, yeah. becomes something that you actually see the reaction of the students. That's at a very pleasant moment maybe that's a better way to put it, to put it. right and i agree with that that's a the, the takeaway for me on that is the just the working it has really nothing to do with the level of the student it's right, just right. working hard to prepare basically and, and succeeding at, at that work you did now it doesn't mean it's the end or it's the peak as this right. article said in that sense it may be a landmark it may be a landmark for the day <laughs> or for the course, for this group, for students, or just uh, for the unit. It's just a landmark because 
uh, you have effort, but, but this can be every single class. I mean, you prepare your class, you make an effort, and whether I understand there may be people that not, they don't really enjoy the planning process, and there's people that they don't even plan. So uh, there is a variable, but once you get there, after you struggle, you actually plan and you dedicate time, whether you like it or not, or enjoy it or not. You go through this process and then you get to the classroom and you see success in the students mainly. Well, in my case, it's when you see students succeeding, not me having a show performance. And, and, and don't get me wrong when I, sh when I say it's show time. I say show time because we all teachers have something of show people, right? But, but uh, better than you having a show time and show performance is a show that made the students actually succeed. And when you see that, I've seen many Facebook posts from our former uh, our graduate students in which they post the students' products very proudly. And you can see some mistakes in there and you can see uh, that the students are really at a basic level maybe. But you see that our products, which were the result of effort from students, which also comes from effort from the teacher. And that's what I like about the idea of enjoying. And yes, I agree, it's not just that moment, but it's very, uh, very pleasant to have this moment. It's very motivating for yourself to go back home in the afternoon, to grade the papers, to plan again, and go for the next day. Yeah, I think uh, I'm, 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 as you're talking about this, I'm thinking about my own experience thinking, you know, I, I've never had a class that went well that I didn't plan for. I mean, and not, not to say that I planned for the class to go well, but yeah. I did some sort of planning mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it, it's not a guarantee that it's going to go successfully, but if I didn't plan anything, and I just showed up that feeling that I would have of like, okay, what are we going to do? What's, what's, what's going to happen? Right. I don't think anybody wants to feel or be put in that type of situation. Yeah. So you try to avoid that by preparing and thinking about what, what you want to do, how, however that looks like, whether it's written down on a piece of paper or it's on yeah. technology or whatever the case may be. But, um, yeah, the planning is, you know, we talk a lot about planning and I know uh, students probably get tired of hearing it, but I think it's really a necessary part of the process um, and it really sets up and allows reflection to even happen. I mean, how can you reflect on something that you didn't even plan on? It's hard because you're just taking, you know, what you did and it's not, you're not really, there's no forethought going, uh, taking place, but. And, and, and maybe, Ben, that's what I like about the article, that it goes through the idea that once you master center degree, once, forget about the mastering, once you made an effort, there is a moment which is, uh, uh, it's nice to see everything you did gets to give you results, whether the peak or not. Now, I, I would like to finish uh, my ideas uh, with uh, now that you mentioned that imagine the difference between a teacher that comes into the classroom and, and there's no plan and he pulls to use the book and have a class and the students achieve something that day or something uh good between quotation marks happens in the classroom just uh, because he was he was lucky do you think that teacher is going to feel the same, is going to have the same kind of feeling of enjoyment than a teacher that really made an effort looking forward and having a good, uh, defined uh, ways to motivate the students, to help them in the classroom since before? I would picture the idea that a teacher that is not planning and he is not knowing and something and the class goes well, it's going to have a sense of, oh, wow, well, good, I made it. <laughs> or maybe kind of a satisfaction, right? <laughs> but in the case of somebody that actually makes an effort and that effort gives nice, uh, nice results and students get to be successful in the classroom, I think that's a greater feeling that has a greater impact on your daily life. Yeah, the teacher who comes in and pulls off a course like you mentioned without any planning, yeah. um, 
is probably either ignorant of the potential that same person, that same teacher could actually bring in to the classroom or he or she just doesn't care. Right. And so it's because, you know, it's, it's interesting because if you don't plan, you bring, you come in and you pull off in class and you say, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm good patting myself on the back because I pulled it off. Then you're saying, well, I don't even realize what my full potential is. Right. Because, you can't convince me that that class, as good as it might have been with no planning, is as good as a class that no. if he had planned, right? It, he could have done even better, right? Yeah, of course. And so it's this now, for me, that screams me mediocrity. This is like, yeah. okay, I'm going through the motions and we're going to get into this habit. And, and unfortunately, we have too many teachers like that. Yes, I totally. So it's like you know this, and this is uh, this is the thing. It's like, how do we overcome that? How do we begin the discussion to bring in and this have this idea of trying to do more, try new things, and right. try to to be better? But yeah, and that's uh, that's all on, on in this discussion because it's really interesting to talk about these kind of things in, in, in from my point of view because. That's one of my tasks, my jobs with my, my teacher's information. I need to find a way to help them discover themselves and being aware that, um, that there's always a way to peak again, to get to the peak performance again and again and again. And I reach it and I'm going to reach it again. And I'm going to do it again. And, I'm, and, uh, and to be aware that uh, the job is that planning teaching, reflecting, planning again, teach again, reflect again, and do it again. Absolutely. I know this conversation has been kind of all over the place. We've been trying okay. to uh, talk about competency and competence and really right. would like to hear from you who have been watching us live and watching the, the recording. Let us know what you think. And if you disagree with us, agree with us, let us know what your thoughts are. Um, we, we really want to create this broadcast in order to create a conversation, not that we're dictating and saying every, you know, what we're saying is the way to be. Um, no, we're trying to offer up a conversation. And again, if anyone wants to schedule a, a time to join our broadcast and we can do something more formally, feel free to let us know. If you're popping in uh, Facebook, let us know to, if you want to just come in and say a few words. We want to make this as conversational and open as possible. Yeah, I, I want to thank everybody that uh, dropped by for a while in Facebook Live. Ricardo Vasquez, Luis Guterres, Brianna, Nancy Mijares, Mitsunari, Santiago, Eric Viveros, Alejandro Pedrosa, Soraya Castro, Gina Padilla, saludo Gina, Jacqueline Martinez, Carliux, uh, Jasmine Macias, Nerlin, Rocío Rangel, Azu, Takray, Alma Zaragoza, José Vital, Cintia Jasso, Ivonne Esquivel, Refugio Bañuelos, y David Samuel, el maestro de la voz. Oh, thank you very much for watching us. And uh, Mauricio Lozano was also around. Jonas Castro, uh, Sandra Reyes, Saida Diaz. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, stopping for a moment and watching us. You can come back later also and watch the full video and uh, join us sometimes. We invite you to give your opinion. Uh, you don't need, if, if you are kind of uh, doubtful because uh, we held this in English totally, don't worry about it. Uh, we can pull something through and we, we see how we can manage that. Absolutely, we can make it happen. And so there's no, no worries there. Um, and I think you can join with your cell phone too, right? I mean, I don't think, um, I think it's pretty open uh, just to come in and, and chat. So yeah, feel free to, to do that. I think yeah, we'll go ahead. If you have a front camera, you can do it. Absolutely. All right, I think we'll stop there, uh, Petey. Thanks a lot for this great discussion, enjoyed it. And I wanna thank everyone uh, for watching and listening and uh, we'll see everyone in the next broadcast. Thank you very much. Keep on learning.